we are recording as of now and whenever you're ready sir take it away okay so uh, we talked about dante as a as a man of his time in the past lesson uh, in order to show a couple of his uh, um, of the events uh, that he that he had that events that had emotional impact on on him during his life but obviously uh, those were uh, connected to external events from him now uh, i would like you to to focus more i would like to focus on uh, his life and his figure uh, as it developed over over the ages uh, first of all he was uh, already famous when he when he died um, during his life as i told you alighieri dante uh, was member of the alighieri family so he started from a privileged uh, position his family was rich uh, they had uh, possessions, uh, they participated to the political life of uh, Florence, and they, um, they were present in, in Florence as already as a family of a certain importance. But Dante was, a, in, in a certain way, an extraordinary man, and people of his time already recognized it, even if... Um, he had to, to go uh, in exile uh, because of his uh, political positions in Florence. Um, Florence remained a Guelph city, uh, but in, in, inside the Guelph party, there were two sides, the Black Guelphs and the White Guelphs. Uh, so he was a member of the White Guelphs, which were um, more independent from the Pope, we can say like that. And uh, when his party uh, was uh, defeated um, during the councils and uh, uh, some events in, in Florentine politics, uh, several of those uh, members uh, of the losing party were uh, put on trial and uh, he, he was... Uh, charged with the baratteria, which was the medieval term for corruption. And he was condemned to the exiled because he didn't want to, to apologize for that. He, he never wanted to apologize. He could, have, uh, uh, he could have returned at a certain moment, but only if he had made a, um, a public apology and he didn't want to. So he remained uh, um, in exile, and his sons had to go um, in exile as well when they reached the, um, the major age, when they were of age. Uh, Dante, with his works, mainly with the comedy, uh, during the exile became more and more famous. Uh, in, as I told you, he went from one city to another, uh, because he, he he didn't have anything to 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 live with he he, he needed the hospitality of other uh, important people in this time people who had the, the the wealth to 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 maintain him to give him money to to live with with them so he went to important lords of the of, of his time uh, he went to Verona, uh, where Cangrande della Scala was uh, very happy and they became friends and was very happy to host him. And then he ended in Ravenna, where he died in 1321 on the, during the night between 13th and 14th September, uh, where there was uh, another lord, Ostasio da Polenta. Da Polenta was the name of the ruling family in Ravenna. And uh, he lived there, uh, and he, he is still uh, there, his body is still there, his tomb is there, it's not in Florence. If you go to Florence, you will find monuments to 
in on to honor Dante, but you cannot find his uh, his tomb. He is uh, 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 still uh, sleeping in in Ravenna, which is in my region. It's not far from Bologna, and uh, we are quite proud of it. Uh, Florence asked asked the Ravenna to give back the the body of uh, Dante several times, and they never wanted to give it back. Uh, even if Florence uh, in recent years uh, um, publicly declared, uh, um, uh, revoked the, uh, condemned uh, the, the exile. So they said, okay, uh, the charges uh, against Dante are, are uh, canceled. They did it in early 2000, something like that. So quite funny to, to, to say, but anyway, uh, as I told you, Dante, uh, became famous quite quick, and he was famous for his uh, his temper. He, he he was not uh, an easy man to deal with, actually. At least from uh, we learn it from uh, uh, a couple of uh, tales of novelle uh, that were written at the end of the uh, 14th century. Uh, not only Boccaccio wrote novelle, okay, it was a very common way of telling stories like the uh, Canterbury Tales, okay. Uh, and we have two of them where Dante is the main character. One, one is from Franco Sacchetti. Uh, Franco Sacchetti is um, a Florentine writer. He wrote a series of uh, tales uh, called the Trecento Novelle, because uh, it's um, made of 300 tales. And in one of them, there is Dante who's walking in, uh, in Florence, and he hears a blacksmith who is singing one of his poems. Remember that uh, uh, several, it was uh, common that poems, uh, like sonnets or other kind of poetry, uh, were written to be to be sang, okay, with music. And Dante had a friend who made the music for his uh, poetry. For example, he meets he he describes him uh, in the purgatory. He meets him in the purgatory, and uh, uh, the, that blacksmith is not singing well, okay. It's uh, it, it's like when you are working, no, okay. You sing a song that you have in mind, but you don't remember the words, so you say some verses. Uh, uh, and some others you don't say them well and you you just ruin the song okay so dante uh, passes by um, the the shop of this blacksmith and hears what he's singing and then when he recognizes that is uh, it's one of his poems he goes inside the the shop and it starts putting here and there and throwing here and there stuff like hammers and pincers and so on uh, the blacksmith is, is uh, astonished and then quite angry about that. So he says to, to Dante, oh, uh, why are you doing, I, why are you ruining my stuff? Why are you doing, are you behaving like a crazy man? Why are you ruining my stuff? And Dante answers, and why are you ruining my stuff? <laughs> why are you singing my, my verses, my poetry in such a bad mm, way? So he was not a, uh, uh, an easy man to deal with, and we can we can think that think that with a, with a blacksmith maybe he was a, a proud Florentine rich man, so probably he could have been a little arrogant. But he was a, this way, according to the tales, also with the great people. There is in fact another tale which is quite funny as well from uh, Giovanni Sercambi. Giovanni Sercambi is famous for a chronicle, uh, he's from Lucca, so still in Tuscany, but not from Florence. And uh, he says uh, in another tale uh, um, uh, from the end of the 14th century, he says that Dante was uh, once invited to the court of uh, Roberto d'Angio, Robert of Naples. So he went there and when he arrived, he was uh, uh, dressed uh, not not well not well enough for for a royal banquet. But then he, he went to the to the palace as well. So 
Sir Cambi says he was uh, dressed as usually poets dress. So probably even in the Middle Ages, poets sometimes did not care too much uh, how they looked uh, and uh, how fashionable they were. Anyway, the servants uh, see, uh, saw there is a uh, dirt uh, uh, dress and put him uh, at the end of the table, far from the king, okay? He, he stays there, he eats the meal, and then he leaves. Uh, in, the, in the tale, Sir Cambi says that then the king, uh, who had not recognized Dante during the, the meal, uh, sends some uh, messengers to call him back. And when he comes back, the next day is invited again to the banquet. Uh, then he presents himself uh, with a very good dress. The, king's, uh, the king wants him to sit right next to him. And when the food arrives in the table, at the table, he starts pouring the wine and uh, brushing the meat on his dresses on the clothing he has uh, on him. Everyone is uh, surprised. They look uh, at Dante as, uh, as if he's completely mad. And the king asks Dante the reason of such a strange uh, behavior. And Dante, uh, Giovanni Sercambi says that Dante uh, answered uh, that uh, since it is the dress that gets honored at this table, then it is the dress that gets the food at this table. Um, this is a, obviously a tale to, to show people uh, that you could not judge a person by its, a book by its cover, okay, a person by its clothing. But anyway, it was funny that Sir Cambi decided to use Dante for that kind of, uh, of uh, example. And Again, we see that uh, uh, dressing and clothing was important at that time anyway, because you could be judged actually by your, your clothing. And when we think about Dante, and if you think about Dante, uh, what, what image comes to your, to your mind? Now I will show you several uh, images, and I want you to tell me which one for is the one that you you had in mind uh, when uh, when I told you I will talk about Dante, okay? Then here we are. Share. Okay, here you can see. 10 different, 10 different images of Dante. They are all famous, but I, I want you to, to tell me which one is the, the one that you had in mind even before seeing this image. Please open your mic and, and tell me. If you want, otherwise I, I'll just guess. <laughs> I think the second one on the, the bottom, let's see, the fourth one over from the bottom. One, two, three, four. Where he's wearing the coif and the, the red this hat. One? But yes. Okay. Yeah, that was the more the one that came to mind for me as well. Plus okay. the one on, I think I have seen the one at the very end on the bottom also. Okay. Well, I wasn't expecting that actually. Because usually the most, the most famous, the, the one that usually are, it's uh, on the covers of Divine, the Commedia and so on is this one. And then uh, this one or this one are very, very frequent. This is famous because he has the book in his hand. And then there are some others uh, less famous, but from famous painters. So I will explain to you. Uh, the most ancient ones are this one and this one. 
they both come from the 14th century. All the others come from the 15th century or later. This is by Luca Signorelli. This is by Agnolo Bronzino. This is by uh, Botticelli. This is by Andrea del Castagno. This is by Raphael, Raffaello Lo Sanzio. This is by Dante Gabriele Rossetti, uh, so it's quite modern. This is from a not clearly specified uh, author. Some people say it's uh, uh, Nardo di Cione, other painters. Anyway, it's on a cover of a um, manuscript. And this is uh, the, the central one in the second row. It's by, by Domenico Michelino. It's very famous because it's, uh, represent, it's the first representation also of the um, mountain of the Purgatory here on the side. Those are almost every one is a detail of a wider, wider fresco, wider painting. But as you can see, there is a lot of red here in this image, okay? A lot of red, which became a sort of standard uh, in uh, Dante's uh, uh, representation. Dante is often uh, represented with uh, red clothing. And if we look at the painting, because all of these are frescoes or, or paintings, uh, if we look at them, usually we find Dante dressed in red. If we look to other sources, at other sources, well, things change. Uh, here you have three images from three different manuscripts, all from the, um, each, one, each one from a little different period frame, frame uh, time frame, sorry, uh, in the 14th century. They were all made in Italy. They are copies of the Divine Comedy, obviously. So this come, the, the one in, at the top uh, left uh, is from, uh, was made in Emilia or maybe Padova at, in the first half of the uh, 14th century. It's one of the oldest uh, um, illustrated copies of uh, uh, the Divine Comedy. Here you have a detail where you can easily understand who's Dante and who's Virgilio from Genova, it was produced in Genova, and this one is, was made in Naples. And as you can see, there is not so much red here instead, okay? Here Dante is dressed in blue, could be blue, partially purple. Here is dressed in pink, rosato, which was a color quite uh, appreciated at the time. And here again, we, can, we find the blue color with some orange, uh, maybe Leonato, which is the color of uh, the lion's uh, hair. Uh, so it's a sort of orange on him. And uh, if we go further, if we go to the 15th century, then we can find uh, Dante almost every time dressed in blue not dressed in, in red. Here we have the um, codex uh, where Botticelli started working. Actually, he, he, it's not finished. Uh, here Dante wears a green garment and a um, pink uh, reddish uh, cloak. Here is dressed in uh, blue. The, both of these uh, images come from a um, uh, a copy of the Divine Comedy made for the Duke of, uh, um, of Montefeltro. And uh, this copy instead uh, comes from Tuscany. It's uh, around uh, 1444, 1450. And again, we can understand that Dante is the blue one. How can we understand it? Because uh, here, Virgilio, but in general, Virgilio is the one with the beard with the white beard showing that is the old one, okay? And also the, the traditional depictions of uh, Virgilio as a wise man uh, imply that he had a uh, beard, that he was old, uh, and usually is dressed uh, more, um, with more important and more serious uh, clothing. Uh, here you can see that he doesn't have the beard, but 
uh, Dante is wearing a more modern uh, kind of uh, clothing, while Virgilio, and actually Virgilius is written here, so even if you had doubts, uh, Virgilio is written as, a, as a, an explanation, but this kind of hood was very old in fashion in the 15th century. So dressing, uh, uh, putting those uh, uh, garments on a man, and who is supposed to be Virgilio, uh, gave him an image of, uh, uh, ancient, uh, of an ancient uh, way of, uh, of uh, clothing. So Dante was not so red in, uh, in, in those uh, images. So can we, uh, how can we say what Dante uh, used to wear? Well, we have to look at the sources. Again, as I did before with Beatrice, we can look at the sources of the time frame of his life, okay? Uh, as we did for Beatrice, we will go through some uh, images in the period of Dante's life. Because we don't have, as I told you, uh, depictions of Dante during his life. He was not portrayed by anyone. There are no uh, copies uh, of the Divine Comedy made by him or made by his order or for, uh, for him. So where uh, a portrait could be considered uh, truthful. And what would have Dante uh, worn at that time? He would have worn a camicia. Most of the terms that I used for female clothing in the 13th century are used also in male clothing of the 13th, 13th century, because uh, in the documents we often find written camicia da uomo, camicia abomine, uh, so camicia for men, for woman, uh, female dress, female gonnella, male gonnella, and so on. So the terms are um, used for both male and female clothing. And camicia was the innermost garment. It was usually made in uh, uh, linen, but could also be made in wool, in wool as this, uh, in, this in this case. Uh, then over it, you would wear a gonnella with a, quite the same shape. It was quite wide at the end, but it is shorter than the female dress, obviously. So female gonnellas would uh, arrive uh, arrived at, the, at least the feet, at the ground. Sometimes they had a, a little tail, uh, while men gonnella, male gonnellas could uh, go below the knee, uh, could even arrive uh, at the ground, but that would imply that the men uh, wearing that, that kind of garment uh, were not supposed to work uh, physically. So they, the, the longer the, the garment, the richer the person usually. And in fact, here uh, we see a um, woodsmith uh, it come, this image comes from, um, from the statue of Woodsmiths in uh, Bologna. It's dated uh, 1270. And uh, it is a very simple gonella with long sleeves. There are some uh, uh, embroidered decorations, but very simple. And the color is not so uh, expensive. This explains the, the image on a, on a Woodsmith. Under the gonella, as... Uh, um, as uh, uh, in personal uh, uh, clothing, you had uh, bra brache, okay, braids, and hoses, calze, which were made like this. This is actually a French image. Maybe some of you could recognize the Maciejowski Bible, but this uh, uh, image is very useful because it shows the uh, the laces going to the probably a belt here, and it shows how wide and bulky were the uh, brache at that time. Then over the gonnella, you could wear a guarnacca. Guarnacca is a overgarment that could have, or the, could have like in this case, uh, sleeves, could even have a hood sometimes. And here we have a hint that probably this was 
uh, with a hood. And guarnaca usual, usually is a longer dress, longer than the, the gonella. So usually, like in this case, you don't see the gonella coming out from the bottom of the guarnaca, while instead you see the sleeves of the gonella coming out. And since this image is from the end of the uh, 13th century. Mm, it's again in a um, Bolognese treatise. It comes from uh, a collection of laws. Uh, this is a judge, and so is dressed with uh, rich colors, deep red, deep blue, and he has buttons on the, uh, on the wrist of the gonella. While instead he doesn't have buttons in the guarnaca, but guarnaca could have buttons sometimes, uh, mainly on the neckline. But over the head, in Dante's period, there were a lot of possible hats, as this uh, Giotto detail uh, shows. This is a detail from uh, one of the frescoes in Assisi's uh, church, San Francis uh, church in Assisi. And this is the scene where uh, uh, St. Francis' uh, father uh, looks at, the, at his son who is naked because he just refused uh, all the wealth uh, from his family. So he took off every, every cloth he, uh, he, had, uh, he had on him. So here we see all the people from Assisi looking to each other saying, oh, look, uh, Francis is uh, crazy, he has gone mad. Uh, why is naked in the middle of the square? But they all have a uh, different way of uh, uh, wearing hats or different shapes of hats. From the simplest one like this to a more structured uh, example like this, which is similar to this one. Uh, this one instead is similar to this one, for example. And then you have this kind of uh, um, uh, hat, which is actually is not a hat, and it is uh, something that we will focus in this slide. In fact, uh, in Dante's period, it was very, very common the use of a hood, okay? But the hood was not wear, worn uh, at least not in the cities, in the traditional way. So if we look at the image I showed you before, this one, here Virgilio is using hood, the hood like, like it's supposed to be used, okay? So covering the shoulders, uh, closing your face uh, and protecting from uh, bad weather and uh, wind and cold. Uh, this way instead, this is the way, the new fashionable way to wear a hood in Dante's, uh, Dante's time. Because you can wear it not using the hole for the face around your face, but using the hole of your for the face around your head. And having uh, the uh, other parts on the sides. So here we can see two, um, two, the two sides of the of, of the hood worn in this way. Uh, this is an image from uh, a detail from uh, Lorenzetti allegory of good government in uh, Siena. So it's uh, uh, 1338, 1339. And here we see the part that, that should go on the shoulders bending uh, on one side. And in, on this man, we see the other part, the part that usually goes back on your head, um, that goes on the other side. So this man in red probably has something like this on the other side, or something like this, which is the same thing. So this part is this part, but it is uh, uh, folded inside the border of the hood. Now, I will try to show you um, this way to wear the hood and actually this way to wear the hood because this image, even if it's uh, often depicted in a different way, uh, this image is uh, the most ancient depiction of uh, Dante. This is uh, inside the Bargello uh, Palace uh, in uh, Florence and it's uh, um, usually thought to be painted by Giotto or by um, 
job to followers, job to uh, pupils. So uh, it could be also a quite uh, realistic representation of uh, Dante, Dante appearance because Giotto and Dante could have met and uh, could have known each other. They lived in the same period. They lived in the same city for a certain period. Uh, they were both in Florence. So probably they met. And uh, uh, this uh, depiction actually uses the hood in another, uh, another way, different from this one and from, from those. OK, so I'll try this. Uh, Reenactment, reenactment uh, experiment with you. So if you have a hood in the shape of the 13th century, so with the short part in the back, okay, this is the shape of the hood. Here you have the hole for the face. Here you have the back part, which goes behind your head. And here you have the part that goes on the shoulders. Mine is quite big because I use it uh, when I do reenactment uh, and uh, I need it to be uh, warm and to cover me. But if you have a little shorter uh, part covering your shoulders, it's, it's easier. Instead of wearing it like this, okay, instead of wearing it like this, you wear it like this. You put the hole for the face on your head. Okay. Then this part, this part bends on this side, while the other part stays on the other side. If it is long like this, it will be covering your shoulders or going down uh, quite a lot. If you have a shorter one, which is more uh, suitable for the city because in the city you always have a, a door to, to recover, you don't do long trips and so on. If you have a shorter one, this will be shorter and you can fold it on the side in order to keep it like this, which is exactly the image that I showed you. So this is the new fashionable way of wearing a hood at the beginning of the uh, 14th century which actually started at the end of the 13th. But uh, there is also another way, which is even more, even simpler, which is just putting the hole of your, for the head right behind you. So you will have a head like this with this part, which can go right through the front, to the front, okay, like this. And then you have the back here, okay? You can see it less. Uh, it's less used and less depicted, but it's common and it's uh, possible. So a hood is not just a hood. It could be used as a hat and it could be quite uh, flexible in, in use. Uh, so it, it is... Uh, um, showing it on, on Dante, it's something that gives him, gives the idea of someone fashionable, not dressed uh, as an old man or in older fashions. And uh, it, it also gives the idea of uh, um, uh, a man who's uh, using things uh, typical of a citizen, not of a um, pheasant, peasant from the, from the countryside. But we were talking also about the red color. Uh, if we consider the paintings, we saw that uh, he's always dressed in uh, red. If we consider the manuscripts instead, he's often dressed in other colors. There are some manuscripts where he's dressed in green also, or in something like violet, uh, uh, other colors than the red. Why is it so? And Virgilio instead is often dressed in red or in colors similar to red in the in the manuscript. Why is it so? Because red was a was an expensive color. Dressing uh, using red fabrics was more expensive than using uh, green fabrics or uh, uh, other colors because dyeing at that time dyeing the, the textiles 
uh, modified the, the, the value of the, of the fabric. So if you have um, silk and you dye it in red, you will have a certain cost. If you dye it in green, you will have another cost. If you dye it in light blue or in deep blue, you will use less or more uh, dyeing uh, um, material. And so the cost of the fabrics will be, will be different. And for this reason, when you find Dante together with Virgilio, this is my personal opinion uh, as a, uh, a clothing historian, you want to show that the, the one who's better dressed, the one who's more important is Virgilio. So you dress Virgilio, who's the ancient one, the famous one, you dress Virgilio in red and Dante uh, humbly in other colors. When you depict just Dante and you want to show him as the great poet that he was, then you put red color on him because red is a precious color. You are honoring his memory. Uh, sometimes uh, we read, um, it, it, it has been written that uh, um, he's dressed in red also because he was part of the um, the corporation of uh, uh, physicians and uh, apothecaries, and they used to dress in red. That is partially true, because that kind of uh, um, colors uh, as, an, as a uniform uh, entered in use later. So in 13th century, was not so strict to wear that color and still was not so um, fixed that if you were wearing red color, you were a physician. If you were, uh, if you were a black color, you were a, a lawyer and so on. This came in use later. So it is not suitable for Dante in the early depictions. And uh, going back to Dante's clothing, uh, we can see that in the manuscripts, there are uh, several um, options of uh, color, but also several pieces of uh, clothing that he has uh, uh, on, on him. When time passes, obviously, you, you lose the connection to 13th century fashion. You lose the connection to the, the historical figure of Dante, and you start depicting an image, a symbol, and you start to standardize it. So uh, when we look at later uh, depictions, uh, the red color and the shape of the garments became a sort of uniform, not for physicians of his time, but for Dante. So if I want to let people understand that the man that I painted is Dante, I have to show him with a certain nose and a certain chin because uh, uh, traditional image is also with those characteristics, but also with that kind of uh, dresses. And since uh, uh, during the centuries, uh, people lost the memory of how uh, 13th century people used to wear, uh, sometimes we find uh, images uh, depicting Dante in a 13th century shape of clothing, uh, but which is quite different from the original one. Like, for example, the image that uh, there is on this uh, uh, copy. This image comes from Gustave Doré. We will see another one. And it is the one that I also have used. Um, Gustave Doré engravings are also in the background of my presentations. And so through the ages, uh, painters started using the red color and uh, certain characteristics of uh, his uh, costume, because at that time it has become a costume, uh, to, to, to let people understand that they were just showing Dante. So now you can understand from a, a very uh, quiet, quick uh, uh, look from, to an image that the man you are seeing is Dante, or at least uh, in Italy it is very, <laughs> very common. Uh, and now I want to show you how different painters uh, represented Dante through the ages. I've already shown you 
some uh, portraits from uh, 15th and 16th century. We saw their uh, portrait by Raffaello Sanzio, uh, the one from uh, by Bronzino. Uh, I cannot show you a lot from the 17th century uh, because as I told you, Dante um, was less considered at that time. So his works uh, were not published uh, anymore, not so much, uh, and painters uh, did not use his image uh, in uh, frescoes and uh, in, in paintings. But then at, in the late uh, um, 18th century, and particularly during the Romantic period, Dante, as all, together with all the uh, medieval stuff, uh, was rediscovered uh, by Romantics. And then he, he returned to be a uh, great man, uh, um, very appreciated also in other countries, not only in Italy. Consider that um, uh, within the 16th century, there were already uh, editions of his works uh, in France, uh, in German, uh, in Spain, and so on. And then people started mm, translating also. Uh, the poem in other languages, but this was later. In fact, I will uh, use uh, uh, a couple of uh, verses in, in English translation. Now I want to show you some, uh, some paintings depicting uh, uh, Dante. So let's start from this one. This is one uh, by uh, Eugene de la Croix. So we are at the end of the uh, 18th century, but the very at the beginning of the uh, 19th. This is the ship of the uh, damned. So uh, this is Caronte, the 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 man who uh, ships uh, the souls uh, to the to the hell. And this is Virgilio, which is uh, represented as a uh, Roman man with this very very wide cloak. And this is Dante. It's not completely red actually, but he has a hood worn. Uh, together with the coif. This is something that we often find in the 19th century, but it, it's not a coif, it, it's not even a part of the hood. And um, this kind of, uh, of detail, it's frequent in the uh, 19th century. Here we have uh, uh, one of the uh, wonderful, because I really like them, I, I appreciate a lot Blake's works, uh, not only as a poet, but also as a um, painter, and uh, he, this is the representation of uh, Minosse, Minosse the judging the souls, and here again we find Virgilio and Dante, they are dressed, uh, they are not even dressed, they, their skin is colored, we can see all the muscles and in the typical representation of uh, by William Blake, but here you see that Virgilio is the blue one and Dante is the red one. Again, Dante Gabriele Rossetti, we're in the middle of uh, 19th century. And this is nice because this, this painting represents Giotto painting the portrait of Dante, which is in Bargello. So this is the, the, the representation of making off uh, of the paint, of the fresco that I showed you before. And this is very nice because on the wall you can see the image that was discovered actually in the 19th century. And uh, it was, uh, the beginning was attributed mm, to Giotto and then uh, to his uh, students. And here you have Dante dressed in green, not in red, and a mixture of clothing from uh, 14th century, 15th century, it's quite a mix of uh, different fashion. And here instead you find the Gustave Doré engraving, which has been on the presentation all along. And uh, it, it's just at the beginning of the, uh, of the comedy where we read the verses, nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura che la diritta via era smarrita. These are the original Italian verses. Uh, these are two different translations. I actually prefer the first one but they were both made by American uh, writers. 
Uh, they both were from uh, the US and they both published a translation of the complete uh, Divine Comedy. And here instead we see a um, much modern uh, portrait of Dante in a series of uh, uh, watercolors made by Salvador Dali. He was asked by the Italian government to make those um, a series of uh, uh, images uh, to for a premium edition of uh, the Divine Comedy uh, for the seventh century anniversary uh, of the birth of Dante in uh, 1965. The work then uh, was not done because people did not like uh, Dali's works, and then he sold them uh, and published them uh, in other, uh, on, with another publisher. But this is, again, the red dress, the laurel, and um, the typical image. An image which was uh, uh, recovered by Milton Glaser in the late 20th century, 1999, for another edition, very special, very interesting, of Dante's work. Uh, he was asked to um, paint uh, uh, images just for the purgatory, uh, because uh, another, other two artists were asked to paint something for the paradise and for the um, hell. I will show you them in a second. But I don't know if you know who Milton Glaser was because he just uh, died last year. Uh, he was a um, graphic designer uh, who is very famous for two works, these ones. And even if you don't have seen, never, you have never seen this one, which was a um, poster about Bob Dylan, I'm sure that you <laughs> have, have seen this one. So this is, uh, the author of that uh, logo, the New York logo. And uh, the um, edition I was telling you about, okay, uh, is this one. It was asked to, they asked to uh, Lorenzo Mattotti, Milton Glaser, and Mebius to um, paint different um, images for hell, purgatory, and paradise. So, this is from Mattotti. I have this uh, uh, publishing. As you can see, there are very strong and modern images. This is the Purgatory from Glazer. And Dante is still dressed in red, as you can see. I show you. Eccolo qua, here it is. Right. And Mebius, the famous comic, uh, um, comic painter, painted some images for the paradise, which are um, typical in his style. So they look like uh, science fiction images, but they, but they actually are connected to the paradise images. These are three volumes, uh, wonderful. They are very beautiful. I like uh, I like them a lot, and it, it, they show how uh, still for modern artists uh, the Divine Comedy, a seven hundred century old, uh, seven hundred years old uh, uh, work of uh, poetry, can be inspiring and can be uh, renewed with uh, with uh, modern connections and modern images. And then we have to say that not also not only uh, painters were inspired by uh, by the work of Dante Alighieri, because uh, there were other comics inspired by him. This is the Inferno of Topolino, Mickey Mouse Infernos. Uh, in Italy, we have. Um, a Mickey Mouse comic, which is very famous. I used to read it when I was a child. And there is a story which was first published um, in uh, uh, the 50s, uh, where Topolino and uh, Mickey Mouse and Goofy are Dante and Virgilio, and they travel through hell. And then we have, uh, you probably, some of you maybe have played this. We have Dante's Inferno, who was a video game uh, set in the inferno and Dante had to fight against all monsters, uh, 
to retrieve uh, his beloved Beatrice. Uh, the, the, the game is filled with errors, uh, so they are married. Uh, she's dead. He has to go to get her back. Uh, and he's coming back to cru from, from Crusades. Uh, he never went to Crusade. Uh, but anyway, uh, the game was, uh, again, inspired by, by Dante. And Dante even arrived to Japan, in Japan, because Gonagai, uh, a famous uh, uh, manga uh, writer, uh, wrote this Mao Dante, which is a story about a um, guy fighting with demons and becoming himself a demon, uh, is, was uh, clearly inspired by, uh, uh, by Dante's work. So Dante is still uh, influencing our culture our uh, uh, society with uh, his uh, uh, with his work with his uh, um, world building uh, and even an, an author from japan uh, like the the one i told you before gonna guy who, who, who wrote mazinga okay mazinga the manga with the robots and so on he was inspired by a man who died 700 years ago and who still is, uh, in my opinion at least, worth to be studied and um, presented to, to all the, the people that could appreciate uh, his, his work. So this concludes my second lesson about Dante, uh, which was more focused on his heritage. And uh, again, if you have questions, I am very happy to to hear them and to answer to them. Uh, otherwise, I thank you very much for the attention. I hope this was a, a, pleasant, a pleasant lesson. Thank you very much for that. That was very, very interesting. Um, I was unfortunately interrupted by my children at one point. You had a picture of a Kimichia um, and I missed your description of where that was from. Yeah, uh, the picture was this one. Um, Getting back. Uh, we have uh, um, very few um, remaining uh, um, extant uh, objects of uh, the medieval times, of clothing from the medieval time. One of them is uh, um, the camicia for uh, Louis the Ninth. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have to share the screen. No. Okay, share. No. Well, this is the image. Are you seeing it? Right. And this one uh, instead is the uh, camicia, which was uh, uh, treasured as um, a relic. Mm, because it was given by Jacopo Settesoli to uh, St. Francis. Jacopo Settesoli was a um, wealthy woman from uh, uh, Central Italy, and she met uh, St. Francis, she hosted him for a period, and she donated him, she gave him uh, some piece of clothing uh, of her, her um, husband. Uh, this is the, the, the camicia. So St. Francis wore it, and for this reason, um, it was kept during history. And this is in, in wool. As you can see, it's long sleeved. Uh, those pieces are missing probably because some pieces were taken as relics uh, during the ages. And it has a very simple and circular neckline, uh, lower in the front and a little higher in the back. I hope it's, is this it's clear. Now? Uh, it is, uh, in, I think it's in the treasure of uh, Assisi, uh, but it's not on show, on display. Okay. But I'm not sh completely sure about that. Anyway, if you go to Assisi, you definitely have to visit the uh, treasure of, uh, uh, which is in Santa Chiara's church. Uh, where you can see her dresses, her, her dress, 
uh, on display. There is a, in Santa Croce treasure, there is a tunic which was, uh, um, which traditionally was, uh, is said to be, um, to, to have belonged to St. Francis, but the uh, Carbonium 14 uh, tests uh, showed that probably come from a later period. Mm -hmm. And uh, th there are very few uh, extant exemplars or uh, extant piece of clothing, but they are worth noticing <laughs> and Thank seeing you. if you have the chance. Okay. Dante feeding his clothing, okay, story uh, comes from uh, um, Giovanni Sercambi uh, tales. Uh, I, it's um, it's uh, the 71st uh, tale of his uh, collection of tales. You, uh, ta -ta -ta -ta, I have it somewhere. It's in the novelle, the title is a simple novelle by Giovanni Sercambi. You can find it online on the website www.liberliber.it. Uh, you can find the, the that PDF is... Uh, um, uh, is uh, available for free and you can uh, find it uh, searching for Dante in, in the PDF. So, thank you. Um, that's it. If you, if you don't have uh, anything uh, other to ask, uh, I let you go to some other classes. And uh, if you want to contact me, you can find me on uh, uh, Facebook with uh, na the name Federico Marangoni. If you want, you can like uh, my page, uh, uh, Renekment Advisor. Uh, you can find all the links uh, in the description of the event of the salon. And uh, I also have a Patreon site. So if you want to go and check it, uh, I publish videos about uh, clothing uh, history, details of uh, dueling, and I will soon uh, do also a series of uh, about clothing uh, during the centuries. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so very much, sir, as well. I'm going to stop the recording.